Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Shri Ayer. Today joining me is Suresh Krishnamurti, a board member of Kona. And we're going to be talking a little bit more into what is happening in the Cisco versus CRD, the California Civil Rights Department, on the caste discrimination lawsuit that CRD brought against Cisco. Initially, there were three people, but two of them have not have been uh, taken out of the case, Sundarayar and Ramana Kompella. And now the case remains with CRD versus Costco. This is all that is left of the original case. But as time passes, this case is getting weaker and weaker until I don't know at what point CRD is going to throw in the towel. We're going to show you right from the beginning how bad the arguments were and still somebody is throwing enough money at this to try and make something stick. So to know more about this and also the uh, background of how the various judges have been ruling in this case, I'd like to welcome now Suresh Krishnamurti ji. Suresh ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Ah, Namaskaram Suresh Garu. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, we met in California a couple of years ago. It was it was great. And uh, now we are catching up again. I'm a great admirer of your work. And and I really appreciate you me. me. Yeah, I'm really appreciate everything you're doing for uh, for dharma and the protection of those who those of us who follow it. Um, so I, I I'm really glad for this opportunity to speak on this issue. There was a ruling yesterday, and people may have seen a lot of press about it. Maybe there's a little bit of there's a there's some noise on Twitter around it. Uh, I think it's important for us to take a look at the ruling, and explain to your viewers what that really means because there is this there is an idea somehow uh, our familiarity with the u.s legal system is kind of poor not everybody is familiar with it they're not expected to be familiar with it but me i'm a legal geek so i read supreme court opinions for fun and one of the things i noticed was there was a general misunderstanding about exactly what this ruling was all about so i thought we could take this opportunity to explore it a little bit so if, if I may, let me start off with a brief chronology of exactly how the Cisco case unfolded, right? So the case was first filed in the summer of 2020 in the, low, in the federal court. Uh, at that time, CDFEH, uh, <clears throat> which is what it was called at the time, they figured that this case was not going anywhere in federal court. So they they withdrew the case from the federal court on the very last day that they could, literally the last day before the statute of limitations ran out on it and refiled it in local court in the Santa Clara, uh, in the Santa Clara County Courthouse. So this happened in fall of 2020, right? October 2020. So at this point, the case has been brought, as, as we all know now, the case was brought against Sundarayar and Ramana Kampella, both engineers at Cisco. But what was interesting was they referred to the complainant, the plaintiff in this case, as simply John Doe. And their reasoning behind calling him John Doe, or in, it's interesting because they want anonymity, but they call it John Doe, which already cuts off half the population. So we already know it's a male, right? It's, a, it's one of those quirks in the legal system. It's kind of amusing. We want to preserve anonymity, but then we call them John Doe and Jane Doe. Be that as it may. So they called it John Doe and they said, you know, we don't want to identify who this person is. Now, in the U.S. Constitution, the First Amendment specifically declares that everybody has the right to all the information in a public trial. That is enshrined in the Constitution. It's a First Amendment issue. And then the Sixth Amendment has another provision that says everybody is entitled to face their accuser in court. Right. So you can't hide behind a mask and accuse somebody. You have to show up. You have to identify as identify yourself as to who you are. The, the rules of evidence are a little bit different between criminal courts and civil courts. But for the most part, the constitutional guarantees are very much there. First Amendment and Sixth Amendment guarantees are very much there. The idea that somebody could show up anonymously in a court was mostly restricted to criminal cases, mob trials, for example, right? 
where you don't necessarily want to show yourself because if you show yourself, somebody is going to come to your home with a baseball bat, right? That kind of thing. That's where it was generally reserved. In civil cases, it is extraordinarily rare for any party, plaintiff or defendant, to be able to pursue a legal claim without identifying themselves. So this is what our court system calls setting an extraordinarily high bar, right? It's rarely granted. Now, of course, these guys, the CDFEH, went full full blast on it. So they filed. So they the case was filed on October 15th, right? On November 12th, I mean, on November 2nd, literally two weeks later, they filed a motion to say, hey, we want to proceed with a fictitious name. And in this, they were supported by affidavits presented by the usual list of luminaries, starting with, uh, you know, Tenmari Sandarajan from Equality Labs, uh, so Dr. Suraj Yangade from Harvard, and interestingly enough, Professor Lawrence Simon from Brandeis University, uh, the prosecutor himself, herself, Siri Tomambam Sat. I, I think I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Siri, and, and so on. And that case, that, that motion was, of course, immediately opposed by Sundar Ramana and, and Cisco. And the judge ruled, Judge Drew Takaichi, ruled on that motion in February of 2021, three months later. Right? So for those who are following along, the request was made in October, in November, early November, and Judge Takaichi denied it completely in February, basically saying this does not rise to the level where we could get rid of the First Amendment provision and allow it to proceed as a, as a John Doe. The matter should have ended there because uh, Judge Takeiji's motion to deny was very explicit. And in that motion, he also said all these subsidiary side sidebar provision, sidebar submissions by by three uh, um, uh, Tanasombat, uh, Suraj Yangde, Executive Director of Equality Lab, Tenemari Sandarajan, Doe himself, Professor Lawrence Simon. And they basically said these articles are not proper subjects of judicial notice. And the request for judicial notice as to these articles is denied. Essentially, uh, Judge Takeichi said in March, you guys have no, you, have, you guys have no business here, but out. Right. Your words don't mean anything. Now, these people made some very extraordinary claims. Uh, we should be for for those who are interested. You can find the actual filings made by Equality Labs and uh, and Professor si and Professor Simon. And when when they make those, they make some very extraordinary claims. They basically say that disclosing John Doe's name in the United States, in California, would immediately put his life at risk, his wife's life at risk, his family's life at risk, because India is a hotbed of violence against Dalits. And the moment they know, and it is amazing how confident they are in putting their expertise in front of the court. But uh, Judge Takeichi basically said, nah, not persuasive, go away. Right? And that's, that's where we were. They appealed it. Uh, so C CFEDH appealed it. So there were two appeals that went to the appeals court from this case. One was Cisco basically saying, we want to compel arbitration. And the second was these guys saying, we want to proceed under a fictitious name. Now, the requirement by Cisco to compel arbitration, the appeals court ruled that, no, we are not going to compel arbitration. We should just do it in trial court. That was one. A year and a half later, in, in August of 2022, the appeals court looked at this request to proceed under a fictitious name, and they found fault with one part of Judge Takaichi's order, where he said that, you know, yeah, we are kind of sympathetic, but people outside of the United States, danger to people outside of the United States cannot be a proper reason for consideration for proceeding under a fictitious name. The appeals court said, nope, that's not right. 
the party that is seeking anonymity has the burden to show the geographically distant family members at risk, but an identifiable risk that the family members will suffer retaliatory physical harm should be treated the same way, right? So they basically found a very narrow technical interpretation that said, uh, Judge Takaichi, you considered five factors. One you discounted, you should not have discounted. So go back and take a look at it. They did not rule that it was wrong. They did not rule that he should proceed anonymously. The appeals court did no such thing. All they said was, you did not take into consideration everything. So vacate it, go back, take another look at it. Right. So the narrative at this point should be very clear. The, the appeal was about, hey, why aren't you allowing me to proceed anonymously? The appeals court said, I'm not opining on whether or not it should proceed anonymously. I'm simply telling you that there was one particular aspect of the analysis that was not complete. So do that again. Right. So they sent it back to the judge. So that came back and that sat there. And that was what was decided on yesterday. So the court ruling yesterday was to say, OK, the appeals court asked me to take another look at it. I've taken another look at look at it. And sorry, you've still not met the burden. So this was an extraordinary opinion. In my view, it was an extraordinary opinion because it does several things. One is it reinforces Judge Takeiji's orders. It specifically states, oh, by the way, we still deny it. We again deny it on those grounds. OK, that's done. And the appeals court has asked us to look at this whole family thing. And we also deny it on these grounds, on the family grounds. And in that, they use some, she used some very extraordinarily strong language, right? So here is, here is one, one particular ex excerpt from the, from the opinion, which I found kind of, kind of interesting, was it says that he has declarations from a few people who have suffered reprisal for protesting the caste system does not provide sufficient proof of likelihood of harm to him or his family. This is all the more true considering that he is potentially identifiable already. And from the fact that his wife's family changed its names decades ago. And then she goes on to really lower the boom, saying if claims of lack of promotion and name calling from decades ago, coupled with a generalized statistics of continuing and sometimes violent discrimination were sufficient, then there is hardly any case of discrimination that would not meet the standard. That doesn't even come close to the extremely high bar that the First Amendment sets in requiring that public have access to all this information. So the opinion yesterday, not only did it say that Judge Takaichi was right in the first place, and yes, if we, if we when we considered this, we found this to be so ridiculous that it's, it's kind of, it, it almost sounds like the judge was annoyed that this whole thing had to be done because she uses some very extraordinary language. One, one sub note, and I don't have a screenshot for this. So I'll just read it in a sub note to the decision. She writes his statement that his mother-in-law recalls a time when neighbors stopped interacting with her because she cooked meat does not indicate it was a recent event, does not establish it was tied to her being a Dalit and in any event and as such, and is hearsay, and as such, will not be considered by this court. Now think about that for a second. Here's a guy who wrote saying, oh, my mother-in-law was affected by this years ago, and that's why I'm scared now. And she basically smacked it down saying, what are you talking about? What happened decades ago cannot be a basis for something that happens today. I think Professor, I think Professor Satish Sharma referred to this yesterday. I think this was a very, very critical finding that the judges made, which is essentially saying, if you're going to claim current harm, you better show evidence of current harm. You can't refer to things that may or may not have happened decades ago to someone who may or may not be related to you, to someone who has changed their name, and then turn around and say, I'm scared. That just doesn't make any sense. Now, it didn't make sense to us going in. And clearly, the judge seems to think the same way. And she's basically saying, well, what are you talking about? So I just want to leave you with that to start with, to say this is an extraordinary judgment that 
takes into account. So if, if any of your viewers are wondering what was what is all the hullabaloo about? Why is this such a big deal? It's such a big deal because it establishes, to my mind, three or four different things. One is it establishes that the US judicial system is extreme, it's, it has very high levels of integrity. You can't mess around with the system the way we think we can mess around with other systems. The judges are mostly, at least in civil trials, they're extraordinarily impartial and they are based on very strong principles. So you can't just bypass them and do whatever you want. That's one. Second, a I have to believe that people like Sura Jengde, Lawrence Simon, they know this judicial system, right? They must know that their submissions and pleadings and whatever will be rejected by the system as irrelevant. And yet they are putting it out there. Why is that? My own theory is they are putting it out there just to create noise, just so they can show a body of Oh, somebody said this. Oh, somebody said that. So it appears on a Google search somewhere. So this, I think, is a is a is an interesting tactic of creating a body of work. And in the world of AI, if a chat GP, in the world of chat GPT and AI and generative AI, this body of work contributes to information that gets disseminated. I think this is a very important, dangerous trend that we should kind of be aware of because a lot of times people are just putting information out into the web, knowing it doesn't make any sense in the immediate context, but is creating a well from which an AI system or a future reference can just show. It's like, it's like birds, you know, when they want to scare their, their opponents, they'll just puff themselves up. You know, they'll push their, they'll push their feathers out and make themselves look much bigger than they are. This, I think, is the same thing. I think people are just putting it out there. So hopefully that gave your viewers and yourself a, a good as a, a summary of what this whole proceeding with the fictitious name really meant. Thank you. And I have one observation. You know, I'm an inventor in a previous time, a previous life, and uh, I have been to many courtrooms. And I, I kind of guessed that leaving it as a John Doe gives them that extra thing when they are going to various organizations like universities or mm -hmm. city councils and so on to say, look, this is not one individual. This is the entire community. Mm -hmm. Again, the same thing to try and stretch a point to the limit and, and say yeah. that, look, that is why it is still being uh, argued as a John Doe. The court is, you know, you can make stories around this. Mm -hmm. What it is, is they have lied through their teeth, especially mm -hmm. You know, I have seen face to face Ten Murray Sandarajan. She really, really is the, the diva of lies, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, she, uh, Suresh, there was an incident where somebody died because mm -hmm. of their threatening yeah. actions. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have, see, this case, I don't know when it's going to see the light of the day, but what really happened to Makwana, Milin mm -hmm. Makwana, that day? that caused him to get so upset that he sat down, he suffered a fatal attack and he, he passed away a few hours later. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, it all took place because he said, I am a Dalit, I am from the backward community and these people don't represent me. I, and, and this, what they are saying here is a pack of lies. Yeah. So yeah. they saw, and, and see the thing, other thing is, they tend to gate crash into every city council meeting, even though none of them reside in that city. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, it is a free country. Yes, it is a free country. And you are also getting, you know, your opportunity to have your say. But to try and start yelling at the mayor and the city officials because they are not doing their job. Under uh, what is underlying uh, there is they are not doing what these people want them to do. Exactly. You know, yeah. it, it, is, it is stretching things beyond the limit. Yes. And, and don't, don't forget, and don't forget, yeah. it's not just that people who don't live in the city are showing up at these, at these meetings. Equality Lab sent out a message for people who don't even live in the country. Remember in Santa Clara, when, the, when they had the hearing in Santa Clara County, yes. Equality Lab sent out a message to people in India saying, when you write, use this zip code, 960, whatever, right? So you can pretend to be part of the Santa Clara community. So they're not they're not just picking people outside the city, they're picking people outside the country, right? To to try and 
try and put their thumb on the scale and 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 play this game. So, couple of couple of takeaways for me from from what you just said and and what I would what I would urge our our Hindu community, Hindu American community, to really pay attention to is when people come in and say, like for example, these thirty anonymous people who wrote a letter saying, "Oh, we are facing this discrimination," or these two hundred and fifty anonymous people who went into Equality Labs immediately after this case and said, "Oh, we also face discrimination." be skeptical be very skeptical because as this ruling shows when it comes time to actually proving things in a court of law anonymity doesn't cut it these people have to show up they have to face cross examination they have to document what happened to them they have to be able to explain why they did not take action until now this is not an easy bar to climb we should not be intimidated by these anonymous numbers to say oh with so much smoke there must be some fire that's what i would urge the hindu american community to pay attention to is don't be swayed by the volume that is claimed by some of these dalit dalit organizations or by the equality labs types because anonymous volumes don't count for anything when it comes the time to actually do something or get something done in a court of law and and uh, suresh i'm also hearing and i haven't checked this myself yesterday when i went to linkedin to look up chetan narsude i saw that you know he has a fairly successful career he's a multi millionaire he has got a few mm -hmm. patents he started uh, you know worked with the start, startup companies and so on today i hear that he has dropped his last name he's just chetan i heard this is on <laughs> linkedin okay is it true I don't know. I haven't. I haven't followed him. I yeah. Mean, not that I care. I, to be honest, I mean, I, I mean right. sincerely. I really don't care about Chetan Narsude. I don't even know if Chetan Narsude is John Doe or not. It doesn't really matter to me. What, I, and I'm honestly mean that. And let me explain why. Because I personally, from where I stand, Chetan Narsude could have been any X Y Z person. Okay. They were swayed. I don't think they took this action on their own. See, I am convinced. that they took this action at the behest of an equality labs of a tenmuri sandurajan whispering in their ears you know what you are going to be famous as the guy who brought equality to california you going to be famous as the guy who stuck it to these upper caste guys you going to be the guy whose whose names is going to be written in the annals of dalit heroes because if you think about it a guy at that position it's not money he doesn't you know he's a multi millionaire what does he care about he cares about being a hero and therefore if it is not chetan narsude it could be somebody else and what i would what i would caution the hindu american community and in fact i would broadly caution the american community overall is when the guys like equality lab when they push up a big deep person like that and i would say the same thing with prem pariya too Prem Pariyar is following into the same, falling into the same trap. He is being positioned by the by the sweet promise of being a hero. The popularity that you that you get is can be very heady. It can be intoxicating. And I think I think that's why this person, whoever he is, John Doe, whoever he is, Chetan Narsude, or 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 elsewhere, he did what he did because he had somebody whisper in his ear. you're going to be famous in a good way right you're not going to be infamous but you're going to be famous in a good way why wouldn't i take that very true very true and also i think the these are all entities that are trying to exploit a sense of fairness that the average american has yes. you know growing up these children are told that your spoken word is as good as your written word mm -hmm. and and, and 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 america has grown up that way yes you can say that oh well they killed the uh, Amer american indians and all that so that happened hundreds of years ago but they have successfully said that this is how this country shall grow and they have demonstrated it it sheer dint of hard work that made america what it is today and and this this particular thing is being exploited i see it being done not only by these people Pakistanis do this thing mm -hmm. the alphabet soup i don't want to call them anything else because every day there's a new four letter combination <laughs> yeah. it will have islam or muslim <clears throat> or together or america or indian i mean this is a ludicrous how many times mm -hmm. and how many ways they try to you know project themselves whatever it is the thing is that 
that sense of fairness is being exploited and i just want all american brothers and sisters please watch out this is what is really going on correct and 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 professor babon has alluded to this in fact he explicitly calls this out in his most recent paper where he talks and he has written a couple of articles following up on that where he specifically and i spoke to him i interviewed him uh, about his paper some time ago on kona uh, that's right on kona yeah. a couple of weeks ago and he makes that point he makes a point saying look americans have two things that are typical one is their knowledge of things non american is generally not very high right because they are so focused on what happens in the united states they tend to focus on what happening there and their overall broad worldwide knowledge is what they hear so that's one but second thing is they also have a natural sympathy for the underdog right so there is a rush there's a long line of people trying to position themselves as an underdog in front of the american people to suggest that john doe was an underdog when he's a multimillionaire and probably in the top 1% of the american of the american public in terms of wealth and 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 income is laughable right so they very carefully hid the fact that this so called super sympathetic person was a multimillionaire right and and this is exactly how these organizations like you pointed out this is exactly what these organizations are trying to tap into they are trying to tap into the natural sense of generosity and sympathy for the underdog that the ordinary american person has and i have been in this country for nearly 40 years now and i've interacted with a wide swath of americans starting from you know people in rural dutchess county in new york to people who are running uh, you know uh, public service uh, these things in in clearwater tampa and 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 everything in between i've been a volunteer emt and a fireman and i have gone into homes of ordinary americans and i have found that they are extraordinarily sympathetic they have their heart in the right place for the most part i mean like every country we always have issues but they all have their hearts in the right place and one of the things that they are always sympathetic to is the underdog and that is what these el kind of organizations equality labs organizations are exploiting they are exploiting the natural american sympathy for the underdog by positioning a group of people who as dr babonis pointed out the dalits who live in the united states about 25000 in number they represent the cream of 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 dalits in india these are people who have made it good they've taken advantage of the of the system of the uh, quota system in india they have whether or not they have actually taken advantage but they were given that advantage but they did it out of their own hard work as well they have made it to the united states on their merits they have not come here because they were part of a quota system they made it here on their merit and it's an insult to suggest that somehow they are at a disadvantage simply because of some random uh, uh, prejudice that 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 is supposed to exist with everybody coming from 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 india that is i find that offensive i find that insulting as a as a resident of this country for 40 years where we all succeed or fail on our effort and our merit I, so i i i completely agree with you i mean this 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 exploitation of the natural american goodness is what i would call it the natural american goodness well it doesn't matter what skin color you are black white blue it doesn't matter i have found that ordinary americans have this natural sense of justice right and that's what these guys are exploiting and it's a pity because there are much more worthy causes for that sympathy than some multimillionaire sitting in silicon valley that's the bottom well line well said well said well said and and viewers this is uh, at this point of time i believe that cisco is not willing to sit with crd and throw them a bone saying that well okay we will implement something or something of that nature cisco is standing for its employees because thousands of cisco employees are of indian american origin and they have vociferously said that everybody if you agree and accept and sign this every every one of us will be tarred by the same brush for no fault of ours and this is a very powerful argument i mean you you have thousands of employees they are all high performers high achievers mm -hmm. they are basically running this engine called cisco and they are saying that look this is not right you should not fold 
That's right. So I think that's what is the stance that Cisco is taking. CRD wants desperately to get something. In my opinion, they are wasting my taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not very happy about it. And, and of course, at a, in a broader way, perhaps yours too. Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, absolutely. California is in deep dodo right now. They are getting money from the federal system. Oh, sure. I mean, they're, 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 they're wasting people's money. They're wasting people's time. And, and, and equally importantly, they are, they are spending their effort on something that doesn't even exist. They can't exactly. even document it. So why, why try to save face? You already, they already have one victory, quote unquote, if I would call it that, because Cisco, in a sense, has already included cast in its own policies within the firm. They should just declare victory and go home instead of prolonging this nonsense, because it's right now it's three for three and oh, right? Three times they've gone to the gone to the court and three times they've lost, right? First, they claimed that Sundar and Ramana uh, uh, were, were discriminators. Oops, sorry, they were not. And they had to withdraw their own case because they were facing sanctions. Then they went on this appeal and said, "Oh, well, you know, this we should go on. Uh, we should go as uh, 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 John Doe." Well, Judge Takeichi dropped it down, and then Judge uh, uh, <coughs> Judge Rosen came back and said, "Yeah, not only was Doug, Judge Takeichi right, here is one more thing I'm going to beat you over the head with. So go away." So it's three and zero. Oh. So these guys are they are losing, losing badly. They should just stop. Just stop. Move on. Right. You made your play. You lost. Move on. Thank you so much, Suresh. And viewers, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. This is the, not the last word, like I said, on this one. We will be coming back and talking about this at more length. And, and uh, thank you for putting on your legal, uh, uh, <laughs> what I would call as legal hobby hat on, your, uh, hat on your head and thinking this thing through for us. Thank you so much. Neither of us are lawyers, guys. So this is just our read on the situation. But we have dealt with the legal system of the United States in various capacities. So that's all we have for you. Thanks once again, Suresh. And, and viewers, if you have not looked at Kona, consider joining Kona.org. Did I get it right, the website? Yes, yes. Yeah. Kona.org. And uh, uh, Sriji, thank you very much for your time. We, Like I said at the beginning, we really appreciate everything you do for the community. We, we, we are thrilled. To have a friend like you working looking out for us thank you so much appreciate much appreciated yeah. thank you Bye.